I have heard many Catholics and other Christians say that the poses in yoga, the postures, the asanas, are dedicated to Hindu gods. They're used in Hindu worship. And so every time that somebody does, let's say a Christian, does one of these postures, they're actually worshiping Hindu gods. But in this video, I'm going to show that that's absolutely incorrect and that's untrue. I researched this for many years looking to verify that and trying to prove that. And in fact, in my research, I proved just the opposite. Many Christians repeat other Christians who repeat other Christians who say that these poses worship Hindu gods and you can't separate the spiritual and the physical because it's so intrinsically linked to Hinduism that they can't be separated. But is that true? Many people mistakenly think that yoga has been passed down for thousands of years as a complete system of physical fitness health, and spirituality. But as we're going to see, that's not true. Most of the exercises, postures, and asanas that we know of today, what we know of and recognize as yoga today, was never even heard of in the history of Hinduism or yoga. And in fact, the exercises are pretty modern within the last 100 to 150 years, and they weren't even made popular until the last 50 years. The various forms of asanas that have been used traditionally through history, other than a handful of stretches, are various forms of the seated pose for meditation so that you can meditate for hours. The poses and the exercises and the postures that we know today are actually brand new. They were never part of yoga and were added onto yoga at a much later date, i.e. within the last 70 years or so. So where did they come from and how did this happen? Most of the postures, exercises, and stretches that we know today were actually taken from other exercise programs, mostly Western programs such as Danish gymnastics, primitive gymnastics, Swedish gymnastics, also known as medical gymnastics, uh, harmonial gymnastics, YMCA programs such as their fitness and calisthenics programs, Western bodybuilding, Indian wrestling, uh, contortionism, and many other things. So in other words, the principal postures and exercises associated with yoga actually did not originate with yoga. They originated with other exercise programs, mostly Western programs that came from Europe and Great Britain especially, that emerged in the mid-1800s to the mid-1900s during that period of a physical fitness revival. So for example, the YMCA uh, was very popular in India, because many Indians were seen as poor. They were laying on the streets. They were thin and emancipated. They had poor hygiene. And so the Christians came in and actually tried to help them through physical fitness and whole being care of your mind, body, heart, and soul. And the Maharajas of India actually welcomed the YMCA and loved their physical fitness programs. Also, a man named Niels Buck started what's known as primary gymnastics, which was a primitive form of gymnastics that focused on healing the mind and the body. And it was actually a precursor to what we know today as power yoga or even vinyasa yoga. All the postures in this practice were accompanied by deep breathing. And this eventually gave way to what was known as Swedish gymnastics, which became one of the most popular fitness programs in all of Europe, along with Danish gymnastics. Swedish gymnastics, other known as <clears throat> Swedish gymnastics, otherwise known as medical gymnastics, were focused on holistic health and healing of the body and soul through physical fitness, through free-flowing postures, and through deep breathing. They wanted to have a connection of the mind, body, and soul through exercise and deep breathing. Does that sound familiar? It should, because yoga took these things from these different exercise forms, especially in large part from harmonial gymnastics. Whereas men's exercise programs were focused on strength-based postures, women's programs such as harmonial gymnastics were focused on stretching, spiritual stretching, and spiritual gymnastics. Through these stretching regimens, they actually focused on deep breathing and wholeness of the whole body, mind, and soul. They even had what was called God glands. Seven glands throughout your body, which Hindus call today energy centers known as chakras, was actually started by 
Christians, people who believed in God and was later appropriated into yoga, as were most of the things we recognize in yoga today. Even the vinyasa ashtanga style of yoga, the free-flowing movements up and down and concentrating on deep breathing all came from these gymnastics and other exercise programs that were already in use and using this style of exercise decades and decades before they were ever appropriated and brought into the yoga that we know today. So all of these exercise programs used these postures, used these stretches, and these breathing exercises long before yoga ever did. So before we explain exactly how this came about, I just want to say at the outset here that we can see clearly that it is impossible that these poses and postures were dedicated to Hindu gods, that they are intrinsically linked to Hinduism or intrinsically linked to worshiping gods in any way because that's just not true. These postures and exercises already existed before in the mid-1930s to the 1950s, a man named Krishna Macharya under the Maharaja of India took these exercises and started borrowing them and accompanying them and adding them into yoga. And so we can't say, and we can't keep repeating the myth that these are spiritual practices dedicated to Hindu gods because they are not intrinsically linked to yoga or to Hinduism or anything like that. They are neutral. They existed beforehand and yoga used them at a much later date. But how did this come to be and how did this happen exactly? Most people don't realize that Hatha Yoga actually goes back to the 1300s and fell out of existence around the 1800s or so. And it was used for about 400 years seriously, but it eventually got taken over by what were known as uh, military yogins or aesthetic yogins who were using Hatha Yoga in the 1800s for military practice undercover because they wanted to overthrow Great Britain and those people who were occupying their country. And so they used it for their martial arts and their martial techniques and they used Hatha Yoga as their cover. And they let all religions take part in this. And so for Hindus who saw this were scandalized by this, that you would take such a sacred, holy practice such as yoga and you would let anyone into it and not even use it for the appropriate reasons. At least throughout most of Hatha history, Hatha yoga was used as a spiritual practice. The exercises in Hatha yoga were actually just a handful of stretches and various forms of the seated position. It was nothing like the asana-laden uh, uh, exercise programs that we know today. I mean, Hatha yoga isn't even recognizable to what it once was. In addition, after the British army came in and wiped out those kind of militia or at least put an end to their practices, the only thing that really existed from Hatha Yoga after it fell out of use were some really dirty, uh, unclean, and unhygienic yogins, as they called them. These people would do public yoga and do crazy, unhuman practices. So, for example, these yogins would sit in the public square naked, or they would do handstands in the public square for hours naked. They would cover their body with ashes, their hair was unkempt, they never showered, they were ever, they were just completely unsanitary and unclean. And people would call them even subhuman. They said that they were more people who existed in a vegetative state rather than actual human beings. Because these people would wear hundreds of pounds of chains on them and just stand there for hours for aesthetical reasons. And so Westerners used to come to India and see this and associate that with yoga. They didn't think to distinguish between, okay, good yoga, maybe a spiritual practice of yoga, something that's positive versus this. And most Westerners saw this and actually looked down on yoga and the Indian people in general because they said their hygiene, look at them, they have ashes on them, they don't shower, their hygiene is bad. So they got a bad rap, or at least they felt bad for these people. So now we have the turn of the century around 1902 and the Maharaj in India wanted to join the revival of physical fitness that had been happening in the world since at least the mid-1800s. There was a huge revival of physical fitness, bodybuilding, and just fitness in general. So the Maharaj and other leaders in India wanted to get into the physical fitness craze, recreate 
uh, Indians and help them to become more healthy and fit and I guess remove the Western understanding or people looking down on them and give them a create a new understanding of the Indian people. And specifically, they didn't want just exercise because, I mean, the Maharaja already loved the YMCA and he hosted the Olympics and different things like that. But he wanted something specifically cultural to India. And there's nothing more cultural to India than yoga. So what he wanted to do is blend the exercise that they had been learning from the West, particularly Great Britain, and blend that with their culture, what was known as yoga. And the two could blend and become one. So he hired a man called Krishnamacharya. And Krishnamacharya is pretty much the biggest pioneer of modern yoga as we know it, other than his students, who I'll talk about in a second. And he developed this exercise program where he blended the two. Now, of note, interestingly, his studio was right next to and shared a space with the gymnastics studio. So he was always taking and familiar with these gymnastics exercises, which he was always adding to his yoga style. And even the props that people use in yoga, they think came from yoga, were actually props that were first used in gymnastics programs. And the gymnastics people used them to help them stretch more, uh, to help them if they weren't flexible or to become more strong or different things like that. And so Krishnamacharya would take these things and appropriate them and synthesize them into yoga. And from the 1930s to the 1950s, he experimented and added on and came up what we know with today as Ashtanga Vinyasa Yoga. It's a free flowing form of yoga where you go in and out of different exercises while concentrating on deep breathing. And his student, Patabi Joyce, would actually popularize that in the United States. And his other student, BKS Iyengar, who's the biggest pioneer of Hatha yoga and yoga in general over the last 50 years, he would make Hatha yoga popular and make yoga popular around the world. So this is how it all started. But it wasn't even until the 1930s to the 1950s that this started to take place. And even when it did take place, most Hindu scholars, yogis, and people of repute in India hated Hatha Yoga because they associated it with the dirty people on the streets who did weird things that they associated with black magic or acrobatics, or they accused the Hatha Yoga people of just stealing from people of gymnastics. And they're saying, why are you stealing a pagan exercise form and putting it into something spiritual? You're profaning it. You're perverting yoga. And so no one of repute actually liked yoga. And by yoga, I mean Hatha yoga, any kind of yoga that involved exercise. Even when it came to the United States, people like Swami Vivekananda literally, wholesalely condemned it. He said there is no way that this can be yoga. And if it is, it is the lowest rung on the yoga scale. Vivekananda and other scholars, uh, prominent people in the Indian world, wholesalely condemned yoga, which is why it didn't really catch on until much later when people started to uh, try to popularize it. In fact, many apologists for yoga who had anti-Western sentiment, they didn't like the West and they wanted to cast off the shackles of the West, they took their exercises, appropriated them into yoga, and then said yoga is the single best exercise program you could have. Even though it really wasn't at the time, they were just saying that and they started distributing tracts and books and pamphlets and creating this understanding that yoga is scientific and that yoga is really good exercise, better than anything the West could offer you because we have a spiritual aspect as well. So it's a connection of your whole mind, body, and soul. And this is what they were promoting. Of course, a lot of the gymnastics already had that, and especially harmonial gymnastics and medical gymnastics, but it worked. And this is how it grew in popularity. And this is how it started to come down to us today because they started uh, advertising it as something scientific. Not like those old people, those dirty people who did that old yoga. That's not real yoga, they would say. Real yoga, it has a strict form. It has a strict structure. It's scientific. It's clean. You know, proper people do it. And so they literally rebranded what yoga was. And so that's how Hatha Yoga started to catch on. And then BKS Iyengar, who's the modern pioneer, of yoga actually made it popular in the United States. But I mean, in the 1980s, there weren't even a handful. You could probably count on one hand how many yoga studios there were. But by the 1990s, it had exploded in popularity. But notice that most people think yoga has been passed down for thousands of years as a form of exercise and spirituality, just something, a component, a system that makes you whole, body, mind, and soul. But in reality, 
exercise and fitness was never part of yoga until the early 1900s. And it didn't even become really a systematic thing in yoga until the mid 1900s. And it wasn't even really canonized or popularized until the late 1900s. And in reality, it's brand new. And many of the vinyasa, ashtanga forms, and even hatha yoga forms were continually added onto. There was no real tradition passed on. Everyone was experimenting. Everyone was making something new, trying different things. And that's how these different forms of yoga developed modern day. But even these forms of yoga, or hatha yoga itself, is a principally spiritual practice, primarily spiritual practice. And if you read any books by Joyce or uh, BKS Iyengar, you're going to see that it's a primarily spiritual practice. Even the breathing is spiritual. It comes from energy. It's not just breath, like scientifically healthy. It actually comes from energy. Energy comes from the goddess Shakti. And there's many things that they're going to say that if you don't do these things, it's not real yoga. So many people at this point will say, okay, I can see how the exercises are different. They came before yoga. They're not part of yoga. And as I'm saying in this video, if you want to do the exercises, the postures, the stretches, go for it. They're not part of yoga. They existed before yoga and yoga has no claim on them. Sure, they've brought them into yoga and appropriated them as a yoga practice today, but they themselves, the exercises are neutral and existed before yoga ever got a hold of them. So if you want to do the exercises, go for it. There's no reason why we can't. And stretching and uh, strength training postures are healthy. It's a good thing. With that being said, many people are like, oh, okay, so we can do yoga. And of course, the answer is no. Yoga is not exercise. Exercise is exercise. Yoga is much more than just exercise. And in fact, when Pantanjali, the one of the greatest Hindu sages of all time, probably one of the most authoritative texts on yoga of all time, when he codified yoga, he made it into eight different branches of which exercise, asana, was only the third branch. And so it's a very small part of yoga in the whole yoga understanding. So when we say, can we do yoga? The answer is, of course, no, because yoga is more than just exercise. If you want to do the exercises on your own, at home, apart from yoga, that's fine because yoga is so much more. And in fact, that's going to be the subject of our next video. So if you want more information on this, check out our next video, which we're going to explain exactly what yoga is in great detail. Or you can check out our new book, which is called Counterfeit Spirituality. Counterfeit Spirituality is a book and we have a whole long chapter on yoga explaining everything and not just yoga, but Reiki, centering prayer, mindfulness, acupuncture, and many other things. What are good? Which ones are not good? Which ones are neutral? And how do you know the difference? This is the ultimate guide of spiritual discernment for Christians. So check out that book. It's called Counterfeit Spirituality. You can see the link below in the description section, and you can find it on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, or at our Sunday Visitor, who is the publishing company. So bottom line, these exercises are not dedicated to Hindu gods. Even today, uh, in the Hatha Yoga system of BKS Iyengar, only a few of the exercises are dedicated to Hindu gods. Most of them are dedicated, and I don't even, you can't even say dedicated, they're just named after human beings or animals or nature. Those are the majority, and a few are named after Hindu gods. So yeah, don't do yoga, don't do hatha yoga, especially since hatha yoga can be especially dangerous if they talk about energy or get into kundalini energy in that meditation. And we've known possessions that have happened through kundalini energy because it's very dangerous, which I'll explain in the next video. But the bottom line is these exercises themselves can and are separate from yoga. That's why we can't do yoga, but we can do the exercises on our own, and we should because physical fitness is important. Thank you for watching this video. Please let me know your thoughts, your comments down below. I would ask that you share this video. Please get the word out there. Get the message out there about this. Too many people are repeating a false narrative without doing any research. And if you're interested in more on this, there's a book that I would recommend called Yoga Body. 
Yoga Body by Mark Singleton is probably the best book that you can read on this subject. He did a full-scale research on three different continents in Britain, in the United States, and in India, and read throughout their libraries, and he got first-hand interviews, and there's so much information. He has side-by-side -side pictures and comparisons between hormonal gymnastics and what we know today as yoga, and he says yoga, even though he's a pro-yoga person. And so the whole thing is so fascinating. It's so interesting. So if you have a desire to learn more, you can check out that book. I highly recommend it. And lastly, but not leastly, please like and subscribe to our channel if you want more videos, especially the new yoga videos, which will be coming out very soon. God bless you.